This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 140. You need to find something to have a plan B in life, whether it's getting a degree, developing a hobby that interests you, maybe something that has some income potential, something that fulfills you and makes you an exciting spouse to come home to. Because believe me, you can really become very boring if you're depressed, you're unhappy, you're not really bringing anything to the relationship. That, that really can set the stage for a, a very unexciting marriage. You need to have something in life that excites you. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds, our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. The Married to Doctors podcast. I am Ammon, my mom's kid, and make sure to like and subscribe and share with all of your best friends. Thank you, Ammon, for that awesome introduction. He's uh, a little stir crazy here at the house, so I told him he could do my intro this week. I can't believe he's going to be in eighth grade, you guys. I also have a junior, a sophomore, a fourth grader, and a second grader. All my kiddos are growing up. They just finished up homeschool distance learning, whatever we're going to call this experience that we just had. I'm so grateful they are done. I feel like a big load is off. I've got an amazing episode for you this week. I hope that you'll enjoy Jacqueline as much as I did. She gives a lot of good advice regarding the legal system and options that I just think it's good for us to all be aware of, of changes and options that we have in family law. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode. As Ammon said, be sure to like, get, leave a review, subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. Oh, and P.S. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, we're having a lot of fun over there. Don't miss out. It's Married to Doctors podcast subscribers is the name of that group. Welcome so much, Jacqueline. It's great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Lara. I've really been looking forward to talking to you today. I really think it's a great topic. You have a wonderful website with great resources, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, I'm excited as well. Why don't you go ahead and just let the audience know a little bit about you so they kind of know who they're getting advice from? Sure, sure. Well, I'm a partner in a law firm in New York. We're right on the outskirts of New York City. We're about a 15-minute train ride, 20-minute train ride into Manhattan. And I happen to be, uh, my firm is located right near a very major hospital system, Northwell Health. Uh, And I'm in a building right now because I am at work. Family law is an essential business. And there's a lot of doctors in my building. And my practice has always had a lot of medical professionals uh, and spouses of medical professionals. So I feel very comfortable talking about this topic. My sister is also a physician. and, And I have another sister who's also a working mom. So I really do feel like I have a pulse on working professionals, doctors, lawyers, how that all pans out, sometimes well, sometimes not. Uh, and family law is, a, is an area where I've been practicing for over 20 years. I also have a degree in psychology, uh, and family law is at least 50% psychology, maybe even more than 50% sometimes. So it's a very interesting uh, field, and it has kept my interest because family law is really changing. And one of the biggest ways it's changed is that women have really advanced in their careers, and the laws are now gender neutral in New York and most other places. So it's an exciting time for women, and uh, the laws are catching up to society. Yeah, that's awesome. What are some of the patterns and trends you've seen in family law over, you know, the course of your career? Yes. So when I started my career over 20 years ago, almost 25 years ago, I was already married and a young mom. I married very young. I'm still married, uh, and now I have four children. In those days, so this is, you know, 25 years ago, it was very much a gendered environment in terms of who did most of the child care and who did most of the breadwinning. I was an outlier myself, especially in my own community. Uh, But there, my mom was a working mom. I knew the joy of working and especially in a professional career. But for sure, I was in the minority. I have seen over the past 25 years, almost a 180 in uh, just gender expectations. Most couples now do have both uh, parties working, sometimes part-time and full-time mixed, and a lot of times parents are working out of the home. And we're certainly seeing that now in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot of people that work in consulting or part-time, 
And we ha I have seen much more women advancing in their careers and men advancing on the home front. So fathers are much more active and involved today in raising their children than 20 years ago. Joint custody is the default starting position in almost every courtroom, with a few exceptions, but for the most part, fathers expect to have a primary role in raising children, and mothers expect that because that's how they've ex ex you know, gone further with their careers. So it's very much a co-parenting dynamic. Uh, it's not necessarily something that parents are interested in when they come to see me, especially in the beginning of a breakup. Uh, they don't like their spouse very much, but the goals, the expectations as we move along the process is really based on both parents with childcare, with activities, and with financial support. So very big change, uh, you know, since family law 25 years ago. I find it really fascinating, but it seems to me that it's moving forward in positive ways. And yet, unfortunately, we still end up with a lot of divorce. And we know that physician families can face this same as the, the next person. So what kind of, mm -hmm. what would you say is the most common reason that people share with you for divorce? The reasons are as the oldest time, uh, you know, it's really a lot of it has to do with growing apart and infidelity. A lot of it has to do with poor communication. Um, but actually, the, the statistics regarding divorce are encouraging in ways. This rate is holding steady at about 40%. And the divorce rate falls uh, with higher levels of education. So professionals, doctors, uh, people that marry a little bit later in life, uh, let's say later 20s, early 30s, as opposed to early 20s, uh, which was going on 20 years ago, uh, that correlates with a lower divorce rate. And there's several reasons why. Because people that marry later usually have more financial stability. They have a little bit more experience in choosing a partner, maybe even living with a partner before they get married. Uh, and higher levels of education, usually people match up a little bit better and they're marrying for different reasons. So the divorce rate among millennials, among doctors and professionals is actually lower than 40%. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an interesting trend in society. Uh, and that goes along with other trends, including prenuptial agreements, friendlier divorces, more amicable, no fault divorces, which is really the norm now. People are marrying for different reasons and they're breaking up for different reasons. I mean, just to bring it back to women breadwinners and women doctors, it is true that probably 80% of divorces in New York, at least, are filed by women. Women generally are the ones that pull the trigger and say, I'm done. And uh, you can verify this in many different places. And, and with women breadwinners, I really think there's a sense that I'm pulling my weight financially. Maybe I'm doing more work at home and helping with the kids and doing housework. What do I need you for? That's not a good place to be in a relationship. And usually when I meet women uh, that are at that point and they come into my office and they're angry, they feel like they have given warnings and they have been vocal about expressing why they're at that point. But it really is a mix of being economically independent, feeling like I can earn my own way. And my children, you know, aren't really benefiting from having the father in the house, maybe because there's fighting or maybe because he's really not pulling his weight financially. It is not a good combo to have someone working, paying the bills, feeling resentful, and then the other party, I mean, sometimes quite literally sitting on the couch, uh, and then sometimes being disrespectful and maybe even being unfaithful. I mean, all of that really does lead to this relationship is not gonna be viable. Uh, obviously, marriage counseling can help with some of that, but if you have a super achiever on one side, someone who's really advancing with their career, whether it's medicine or something else, and the other side, the other party not growing, not advancing, maybe even wasting or dissipating assets, uh, gambling, uh, substance abuse, you really can have you know, people really moving in very different directions and depending on the cultural issues, religious issues, a decision to divorce sometimes uh, is gonna be considered and uh, it really, it becomes about you know, what makes the sense for the individuals and then together as a couple, it, it's really, sometimes too late to save a relationship like that. Yeah, I find it really fascinating that it's 80% women asking for a divorce. I did not know that. But yeah. I think you're right. You know, with the trends of society, I can definitely see that. And one reason I wanted to, you know, have this podcast and have this space was to talk to 
really the non-physician spouse, although obviously today we're talking to both sides of that equation, but yeah. I feel like it is easy sometimes to feel like, well, they're going in advancing their career. It made sense for me to stay home with kids. But then when you right. are home with kids and you have that discretionary time, it is easy to develop an addiction, whether that's right. to pornography or Facebook or food or whatever. And I can see how infidelity can come up just because, you know, you're texting old friends or, or things like that. Yeah. And so it, it's always a challenge. And that's one reason I, I care so much for physician spouses is I want right. them to take care of themselves, keep themselves one foot in the career door, so to speak. I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not, I don't think there's right or wrong if you work outside the home, but I do think you need to have your own interests. You need to keep yourself. You are, you are so right. You, you're very right. And, and a lot of that also is just um, in terms of legal issues and financial issues. First of all, just to speak to the infidelity issue, I just read this great article, you know, Ashley Madison, that website, that infidelity website, uh, their, their business has doubled during the pandemic. They have, I think, 19,000 new visitors a day looking for some sort of extramarital something. And 30% of the visitors are women. So it's not just men being unfaithful. It is women too. But you're right. When you have a spouse at home who has too much time on their hands, not feeling fulfilled, they are going to sometimes get up to no good. It could be compulsive shopping. It could be looking for excitement online on Facebook or with classmates or could be drinking. I mean, people have to get through the day and they have to cope. And the risk to them, though, under New York law in particular, is that the earning spouse, the one that is advancing the career and earning the bonuses and the income and maybe writing and speaking and branding themselves, if there is a divorce, the stay-at-home spouse is really going to be harmed financially because all of the new laws reward the earning spouse the moneyed spouse. Yes, that spouse does have to pay spousal support. So there is some alimony, there is some income, but spousal support is much more limited than ever before. The amounts are lower. It's no longer a tax write-off. So that incentive isn't there that used to be there. Uh, and worse than that, you know, the nurse that puts her husband through medical school or the waitress, even worse, that, you know, is uh, taking care of the kids and, and still bringing home money to help her husband go through medical school and develop a practice. Under the new laws, she gets nothing. She gets zero because the medical degree is no longer a marital asset. And the medical practice, unless she's uh, at the front desk, you know, office manager type or really active with the practice, she's not going to get a big percentage of that practice. So it is very risky to stay home and declare yourself to be the stay-at-home child care provider. And that's enough, and I should be rewarded for that. That's not gonna fly in divorce court. Of course, I believe mothers, fathers that stay home with their children, it is the hardest job in the world, but it's not recognized in terms of finances and, and the legal posture. So it's a risk, uh, and it's even a risk in a happy marriage. And so this is what I tell stay-at-home spouses or the homemaker, whether it's the, the, the man or the woman, you need to find something to have a plan B in life, whether it's getting a degree, developing a hobby that interests you, maybe something that has some income potential, something that fulfills you and makes you an ex exciting spouse to come home to. Because believe me, you can really become very boring if you're depressed, you're unhappy, you're not really bringing anything to the relationship that, that really can set the stage for a, a very unexciting marriage. You need to have something in life that excites you. Does it need to be something that brings in revenue? Not necessarily, but something that develops you, helps you grow. And you have to look past the time when your children are in school because you need to have something that maybe you can do when your children no longer need you as much. And, uh, you know, it's not just about divorce. Your spouse, the breadwinner, could, could, there could be a disability person, they could be a death. I mean, look at what's happening right now with coronavirus. That could, person yeah. could become disabled. They could have I would a financial also, reversal. I would also think that this is a great time to remind people of the importance of a prenup because yes. you could set all this up ahead of time. And then if, and when the right decision is for someone to be home with the children, which I think is true in many cases, then 
you don't have kind of that concern because you've already discussed with your spouse ahead of time what that would look like if there were to be a divorce that you've kind of already set those boundaries. And so then I think you, as the stay at home spouse can feel more at ease with those decisions because you have more protection because yeah, you have the great. prenup. Yeah. I mean, a, pr a prenup can definitely help protect a stay at home spouse because it provides for some sort of a safety net. Uh, what I love about prenups and you can do them after the marriage too. It's called a postnup. It's the exact same thing. People negotiate them when they like each other when marriage is good and when they really do feel like they want to protect each other a little. A, a good prenup obviously has lawyers on both sides, but there's things in there that are really good for both parties. And it can be something as simple as life insurance. It can be providing for other types of protections financially. All right, let's just pause a minute here and I will tell you about my sponsor for the week. Hey listeners, I'm so excited. I have a new sponsor, which is BetterHelp. That's Better H-E-L-P. BetterHelp is an amazing resource for us, especially during this time of the COVID crisis. They offer licensed professional counselors that can work with you either through video chat, old school telephone calls, or text messaging. I love this because if you're like me, you have children around you and it might be hard to find a quiet downtime to speak with someone. I hope that you will consider reaching out to them. They do have financial aid available at this time. And if you'll reach out to them and tell them that you're a Married to Doctors podcast listener, you can get 10% off your first month if you go to betterhelp.com forward slash married, M-A-R-R-I-E-D. I'm actually using them at this time myself. I was matched with my counselor, Gail, in less than 24 hours and have really enjoyed the resources that they offer. So again, go to betterhelp.com forward slash married to get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit to the, the physician spouses that are female and... Do you feel like, I guess you said like 80% of divorces are filed by women at this point, but what has kind of favored them as they have become a larger part of the workforce? I believe uh, the class of 2020 was the first class to have more female physicians graduating right. from medical school than males. And so we know that just in a few years, as they finish up residencies, that's going to tip the balance yes. and we'll have more practicing physicians that are female than male. And so how do those trends affect family law? The way they, they affect family law is that a lot of these types of, first of all, it's become less of a stigma, uh, which is huge to have a working wife. And to have a working wife who's a professional and to have uh, someone who's earning more and might have more career possibilities and opportunities. So you are going to see relationships where maybe you have an older professional wife and a younger male partner. There's obviously going to be more same-sex relationships. Those are coming out, out of the closet. A lot of these stigmatized relationships, including cohabiting. You don't necessarily have to be married to be in a good relationship. And now with surrogacy law becoming passed in New York and is sort of gaining ground all over the country, you are going to see even that come out of the closet. I mean, Kim Kardashian has two children by surrogate. Celebrities now are very open about the fact that you can't necessarily maintain a career and have children or bear children. There are all kinds of reasons why there's infertility. So this is going to create all kinds of exciting new possibilities for families to either grow their families or delay parenting until a little bit later in life. Obviously, it helps same-sex couples, and it helps single women professionals or male professionals that want to have other options when it comes to having children. So many issues that were stigmatized and sort of taboo before are completely out in the open now because of gender-neutral laws. And I think you're going to see sort of women that choose different partners that are more nurturing, that are maybe you know, going to cook dinner or maybe be home, working from home, all kinds of possibilities like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. And when we look at those 
divorce statistics that you mentioned and how divorce is actually lower, you know, for sure, in my opinion, anyway, one of the reasons that's trending that way is so many people live together, right? So we don't get married as young, but we have like these horrible breakups. You know, you hear of people that have been together eight, 10, 12 years, and then they break up and it's not a divorce, but it might as well be, right? Like it's just as emotional. Finances sometimes can even be tricky then. And like you said, like those can be the years that someone has really kind of worked their spouse through med school. And that can be... That can be really difficult when those breakups happen. So I think it's interesting that there's even like cohabitation laws now. What does that look like? Is that just proving that you shared an address for a certain amount of time? I mean, you know, even with cohabitation, there are really risks to the partner that doesn't have their name on the assets. So if you're going to cohabit with someone and put money towards a house that maybe you both live in, both names should be on the deed. Or there should be a cohabitation agreement that says we're going to share in the value of this asset. Or if the people are going to share rent or buy property together, it's always better to have things in writing. The worst outcomes are the ones where people trust each other, nothing is in writing, and then years later, one party suffers way more than the other. And, and in all legal matters, you need proof. You need documents. So a cohabitation agreement really is a good communication tool. It's uh, agreeing on things, reducing it to writing. This is what we expect will happen. You know, this is how we're going to share expenses. And um, almost always, uh, you know, it's not as romantic. And prenups used to be very heavily stigmatized because it was always this feeling that a written agreement regarding a relationship is, is because of a gold digger and sugar daddy dynamic. Well, that's not true anymore. Uh, people with very little money sign prenups. It really is so that expectations are clear and there's no misunderstandings later on. And uh, prenups, cohabitation agreements, even frozen embryo agreements, these don't have to be lengthy or expensive. It's really a few pages sometimes. And it can save a world of hurt, certainly can save a lot in legal fees later on because you're held uh, to the standard and these documents are enforced. Mm -hmm. So they're good to do. Yeah, for sure. One of the things you mentioned as well is that divorces don't have to be awful anymore in all cases that sometimes people are just, you know, there's the no fault divorce now. People are more accepting of divorce in general. And so what is the friendly way, I guess, to get divorced? You know, um, so much of whether or not it's even possible to have a friendly divorce really depends on the personalities and the psychology of the people involved. First of all, you can't have a friendly divorce if there's domestic violence. You just can't because there need to be boundaries and there needs to be safety. But that's a small minority of cases. Uh, And I'm talking about actual violence, even if it's verbal or emotional. Most cases, and I always use the 80% rule, 80% or more of cases have the potential to be reasonably friendly. Uh, And it can run the gamut from parties that get divorced and still spend Christmas together and go on vacation together to parties that are friendly, meaning they can stand on the soccer field together, watch their kids play ball, and be civilized. And there's no reason why people can't get to that point. Uh, A lot of it depends on the lawyers they choose. It depends on how messy the situation is in the beginning, if there's some basic respect in the beginning. And so when I meet with clients that are angry and upset because their marriage is breaking up, a lot of times it does have to do with an infidelity. And when I'm, when I'm speaking to the party that is already moved on with someone new, I always say that it's really on you to make sure that you're not rubbing your spouse's nose in it. No pictures on Facebook. Don't flaunt your new person, you know, coming to the front door of your house. Don't introduce your children to someone new before it's time. Really create boundaries and be respectful. Your social life really should be private. And you really need to respect the person that you were with especially if you have children together. So if you could start off, I always call it the high road. Take the high road, be decent, you know, support your spouse financially if that's what you were doing. Maintain the parenting contact and maintain a schedule. Don't start off fighting over things that don't need to be fought over. And if you can start with that position of decency and kindness and then choose lawyers that support that 
and really just try to settle your case quickly and fairly, you're going to inherit a case, a relationship with your ex that pays dividends for years to come. And not only for yourself, but for your children. Because you want to get to that point, uh, and I really try to get my clients by the end to really say, I wish the best for my ex. Didn't work out for us, but we have children that we love, and I wish them the best. And sometimes you need a good therapist to get you there. Again, not everyone is capable of getting to that point of neutrality uh, and feeling well for their ex, but most can. And it really does start with making a decision to fight over things that don't need to be fought over and really making concessions. Mm -hmm. There are some people that really never recover from divorce. I would say a very limited number, less than 10%, that take the betrayal of a divorce and never recover from it. They hold on to that victimhood status. They carry it forward into their next relationship. They're bitter and angry, and they end up going to family court again and again and again. And they never recover. And it's very sad. And it really has to do with how people process loss. It's those same people that never seem to get over from the loss of a parent or never get over the loss of a job or have very toxic relationships, even in school or as adults. It, it's, a, it's some sort of personality type. Very hard to fix. But I have seen improvements with therapy. I really do think it takes radical forgiveness to get through a breakup. Uh, whether it's a divorce or a job loss or the loss of even a friend, you have to really be willing to forgive in, in a way that's extreme. And, and even when the other side doesn't deserve it, just get to a point where my life is worth living. I'm going to move forward with positivity. My children don't deserve a legacy of hatred and fighting. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to have a friendly divorce. Uh, it takes a lot of coaching to get there, but it's worth it. It really yeah, it's is definitely. And I enjoy, I enjoy and working. Yeah. I wanted to ask you too, like how many divorces are solved outside of court? Like it's not always necessary to go to court, right? Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. Mo first of all, statistically speaking, and it's funny because this is all over the country, at least 95 to 97% of cases settle without a trial. And the reason is there's not enough judges. There's not enough courtrooms. And most people run out of money before the trial. And the system is set up to exhaust you financially, emotionally, so that you'll just give in at some point. So most cases settle. And most cases, probably at least half, never even go to court or even get filed in court. Uh, so they're really uncontested divorces. Uncontested divorces are really just, I want nothing from you. You want nothing from me. You know, we have a child support order, we have a custody agreement, we're done. Most people, that's where they fall in. Now, they might want to fight. They are not ready to sign off on an uncontested divorce. They don't want to settle out of court. So people do engage lawyers, usually when they're angry, and they want to fight over something. You can't fight over grounds anymore because it's no fault divorce. And increasingly, you can't fight over custody because most parents are getting joint custody. But that doesn't mean people won't take unreasonable positions. Most cases settle, and the truth is they settle when people realize it's not worth spending the money and the time, and it's time yeah. to settle. And, and good lawyers will encourage their clients to settle from the very first day. Start putting that thought in their head. Your case is probably going to settle at some point. Let's figure out what's worth fighting and what we can resolve. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important that people hear their lawyers. Most lawyers do want to resolve their cases. I would like to take my cases all the way to the finish line in every single case. I don't like it when my clients run out of money or get frustrated. And I have to tell them, you know, your strategy has to match your budget. And really, you don't want to create an enemy. Let's really try to focus on having an amicable custody settlement if we can. Mm -hmm. Not every client is receptive to that. And a lot of times people will tell me, Jackie, I don't want to settle. Why are you telling me to settle? They don't get it. Later on, they do. I just wanted to ask you, in, in your experience, do you have any tips for divorce proofing your marriage or kind of what works well to keep uh, uh, for a long, healthy well, marriage? Well, I'm married 30 years, so I, I definitely have some advice in that area. I mean, I really, first of all, I come from a very traditional background and, you know, divorce is really not an option where I come from <laughs> and, and really does come to as sometimes as simple as we're just not going to pursue the path of divorce 
ever, no matter what. So it really comes from not considering divorce to be an option and exhausting everything before you go to a divorce lawyer. And that might mean marriage counseling, and it might mean a date night, and it might mean scheduling time to go for a walk with your spouse. It definitely comes down to good communication and prioritizing family time. Obviously, it means don't cheat on your spouse. I mean, if you're going to go in that direction, you're really playing with fire. It means not keeping financial secrets. I mean, you can have a few secrets, but ultimately, you have to be open and honest about financial issues. You have to be respectful to your in-laws, things that are common sense. But you're playing with fire. If you're going to be disrespectful with fidelity, uh, disrespectful with money, disrespectful with in-laws, these are things that are definitely risky to do if you want to stay in a long marriage. So it means that sometimes you have to put yourself out there and go more than halfway. And I can come up with all kinds of examples, and I know most women can, where they do more than their share. And sometimes, you know, you have to know when a marriage cannot be resolved. And I, I, I would include domestic violence, physical violence as the real deal breaker. Almost everything else can be possibly resolved. And I include infidelity. I have seen many marriages recover from infidelity. Uh, it does take radical forgiveness, which is what I mentioned before, you have to be willing to completely forgive and never mention it again. And it might take a year of therapy to get there. But to divorce proof your marriage, you have to um, really avoid divorce lawyers. That's really, <laughs> that's really my number one advice. Don't go to a divorce lawyer when you're- Put angry. you out of business, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I put my you know I talk a lot of people out of divorce as you can tell. I really believe in marriage. I believe in marriage, and I believe that if people communicate and are honest, and prioritize the relationship, and forgive transgressions that can be forgiven, you can stay married for a really long time. And when the marriage is not healthy, when it's damaging you, and infidelity, domestic violence can fall into that category because it takes away your dignity. It can really harm someone psychologically. That's not a good relationship to stay in. Yeah. Well, it has been so wonderful to talk to you today. Do you have any other questions I should have asked? Anything else you wanted to touch on as we wrap up? Oh, no, no. I think it was a terrific discussion. And um, I'm going to definitely be um, promoting your website to a lot of the doctors I know that I can see some of your resources I think are really going to be helpful to some people that I know. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks so much. If anyone wants to reach out to you, what's the best website or way to contact you, Jackie? I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And I run a family support group on Facebook. If anyone wants to check it out where I post a lot of information. But my firm's website is lawjaw.com. L-A-W-J-A-W.com. Uh, I have an amazing team here in the office. We're nine lawyers, a big support staff, and um, we have a free consultation. We always have, and we consider ourselves to be a resource. We help uh, professionals all over the country with questions about family law topics, and we're always here to help the community and give back if we can. So thank you for letting me say that too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for being on the show. My pleasure. Have a great day. Thanks, Lara. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at marriedtodoctors.com.